questions. Okay. So what we put together is a series of PowerPoint slideshows as review. Some um, have questions, some don't, but we wanted to make sure that this was pretty comprehensive for everyone and not relying on what additional questions we can find. So um, you being our only participant right now, I'm going to ask you questions and hopefully you can respond because this was um, goodness. <laughs> Mine was built as more of a let's see what you remember kind of thing and then ask the question. So what do you remember about diabetes and sip it? Serious. <laughs> um, it's it's the amount of the antidiuretic hormone, and yep. so they get excessive urination. Yep. Then their urine is going to be dilute. They're going to be urinating a lot. That's the expectation uh -huh. before treatment, right? Um, so then you're looking at that specific gravity being very dilute. So then that's your application of it is knowing your specific gravity so 1.005 it will be less than that so water is usually 1010 and so it's actually more dilute or very close to dilution of just water urine so that it's really bad so then because they're putting out all that urine there i was for dehydration right so then we're going to promote fluid intake to treat this and also vasopressin. So then our goal at this point will be a decreased urine output. In the beginning, we can't have decreased urine output because they're having increased urine output, right? So I want to make sure that these don't get confused with each other, but also before and after treatment. So make sure you know where in the scenario you are when you're answering these questions too. Um, so vasopressin, desmopressin is the generic there to treat diabetes insipidus. Um, and so then we're looking for this large amount of urine output to be decreased. Um, and then your specific gravity also will improve to not be so dilute. Um, SIADH is also antidiuretic hormone, but the other way, so you're going to actually have the low urine output in here, and they're going to be overhydrated and retaining fluid. So then this is where we're going to restrict fluids in SIADH, not DI. So what your book says is restricts fluids to one liter a day. Okay. Hypothyroidism is what? The low T3, T4, but you're going to have a high serum TCH. Okay, we're going to treat that with Synthroid Olivothyroxine. And that may take Can some. Do you know the difference between primary and secondary? No. Okay, not for this class. Um, but you need to know what's going to treat it. Um, liver thyroxine is that generic version of it it does take um some time to uh take effect and remember this is the synthetic hormone so remember thyroid hormone stimulates every system and so you have to monitor and make sure that they don't miss a dose also extra dose um all those things um and watching your cardiac um system for monitoring of that synthroid medication because then what you can have is hyperthyroidism. So this is when all systems are being stimulated and we're going to treat with PTU, propyl thiouracil. But remember that main um, concern, complication of PTU is agranulocytosis, which is uh, what? <laughs> Do you remember? Um, excess granulocytes? I don't know. <laughs> um, so this is actually a decrease in white blood cells. And so then you actually have an increased risk for infection. So you're going to look for those opportunistic infections that occur as a result of that. So they get a cold or um, thrush or pneumonia. Um, 
any kind of opportunistic infection as a result of their immune system being affected from the PTU. So they're going to need to make sure that they wash their hands, um, that they don't share food drinking after each other, things like that. So they don't acquire infections because they're going to be at more risk at this time. Does that make sense? So yes. that good hygiene techniques. Hypoparathyroidia. So again, like I said, there was hard to find a lot of questions. So I think the endocrine section only has like one question. So sorry about that. So most of this is just review. Hypoparathyroidism. Um, so is a low uh, calcium is essentially what we're looking at. So your signs and symptoms are going to be associated with low calcium. So numbness and tingling in the extremities. Um, and then excessive contractions, um, hyperexcitability, and a positive Schwachstick sign. So remember the hypocalcium. Hyperparathyroidism is the hypercalcium. But remember that it's hypercalcium because it's taking the calcium and breaking it down from the bones. But it's high in their bloodstream. So that makes their bones then risk for fractures and injuries from falls, right? Because now their bones are being broken down as a result of hyperparathyroidism, breaking down that calcium out of the bones into the bloodstream. And then Addison's disease is cortisol deficiency. And so sometimes this can mimic hypoglycemia. So you have similar symptoms as hypoglycemia. So that might be able to help you remember your signs and symptoms there. Um, and we're going to treat by replacing with cortisol. We're also going to increase their salt intake. Um, so their sodium levels are going to be low due to this cortisol deficiency um, affecting their urine. So then we're going to treat it with increasing their salt intake. Cushing's is the other way around. So um, most of this is going to be uh, signs and symptoms. So you have alopecia or Cushing syndrome. That's that male pattern baldness, um, but this will be probably in females because then male pound and baldness on a male, it's just them going bald. But so usually alopecia in respect to using the term refers to a female. Um, and then a moon face. So that's that round, red, full looking round face like a moon. Um, purple striations. So this is going to be uh, the striations on the abdomen, thighs, and the breast and the buffalo hump. So a lot of people remember the moon face and the buffalo hump, but just remember that there's other symptoms. Uh, make sure that you know what they are and why they're there. Um, uh, so the buffalo hump is because there's fat between the full shoulder blades. You don't have to know why they're there, but remembering the fat between the shoulder blades reminds, makes it stick in my brain. So that's why I, I like to know why instead of just memorizing a bunch of things. And so this little tidbit here has always stuck in my brain as a result of the buffalo hump. So a fat cushion, <laughs> that's how I always remember it. Um, so buffalo hump, purple striations, moon face, and alopecia. Diabetes mellitus. So this is going to be hyperglycemia symptoms. And then we're going to treat it, but then that's going to give us that risk for hypoglycemia. And then, so we need to give a lot of education um, and treatment is going to be different. So it's going to depend on what's going on with the client. We, of course, need to make sure that we're monitoring those um, glucose levels. So I, I'm putting in here as a reminder, expectation for glucose is 80 to 120. Um, and then we're going to continue to use your insulin during illnesses. Some of these things I may not have expressly said, but you've had diabetes before, but I want to make sure that these parts aren't forgotten. Um, so just to reiterate, and then prior to physical activity, exertion, you know, a child going outside and going to play, 
on the playground, make sure that they've had a snack. And it's usually about 30 minutes to an hour prior to the activity. That way it's the carbs are already being broken down by the time they're out on the field, um, football field, playing basketball, whatever. Okay. So question for you, Dawn. The nurse is teaching the parent of a preschool child how to administer the child's insulin injection. The child will be receiving two units of Humulin R and 12 units of Humulin N every morning. How should the nurse instruct the parents to prepare the insulin? I'm reading the choices. Mm -hmm. Um, the second one. Okay. Yep. So clear to cloudy, right? Yes. But remember you're going to pull up that air before you pull back so that you don't create that vacuum, right? So when mixing insulin types, always withdraw the clear rapid acting insulin to syringe first and then the long acting. So that's the clear and cloudy. Um, thing that we always remember. And so therefore the um, humulin R will be drawn into the syringe first. Uh, blood glucose results between 70 and 99 are considered to be euglycemic normal. So it's normal or close to normal. And the prescribed dose would be administered to maintain the euglycemia. It's just to check the blood glucose first if the result is this. Um, withhold the insulin injection which you might but the question is how should the nurse instruct the parents to prepare this isn't a preparation that should already be determined before preparing so that's a different step so don't let something like that distract you okay does not answer the question so then gestational diabetes is diabetes that someone who's pregnant has now acquired. Um, it's usually conditional in the pregnancy. So we're gonna control it with diet and exercise and monitor it as close as possible. Um, and then do you remember the uh, hypoglycemic medication that's safer for pregnancy? can't remember it off the top of my head. <laughs> Glyburide. But yeah. Okay. I'm sure, I'm sure you'll be able to recognize it. <laughs> so yes. glyburide is that one um, that isn't really talked about in the adult world side. So I want to bring that to the attention in this class because it is um, safer during pregnancy. And especially if this is conditional on her pregnancy, then we're not already on hypoglycemics before she got pregnant. So this would probably what be what you would expect her to be taking. The M1. <laughs> Seen a theory. Um, so now is respiratory review. So acute infectious pharyngitis. What is that? Strep throat. So these are interchangeable. Acute viral is from a virus, but infectious refers to the bacteria and the bacteria is the strep, right? So this is the same thing as strep throat. So if you see those terms, make sure that you know that we're talking about strep throat or strep throat is this so that you don't forget what they are and how to treat it. So that's this bacteria that is going rampant in their throat, right? Pharyngitis in the throat. So we're going to need to remove any infected item. So anything that has been in their mouth, their mouth hygiene, their toothbrush, um, if, uh, they're using mouthwash and they put their mouth on the top and they don't pour it into a cup. Um, you got to think about those little things. Um, make sure they're not uh sucking on something and then putting it down like a pacifier if a young child has 
uh, strep throat, things like that, that could be then infectious due to the strep bacteria, the group beta strep. Um, and so we need to replace and remove all of those infected items. As if it's something that can't be replaced, then you have to boil it in water um, to kill that bacteria. Also, we're going to start them on antibiotics, which means that they can't return to school. They can't um, uh, re they're no longer non-infectious until after 24 hours of antibiotics. So again, with the replacing their toothbrush or whatever, uh, if your child is diagnosed with strep throat and you come home and you immediately replace that toothbrush and then they use a new one that night, well, that new toothbrush is now infected because it's not been 24 hours on the antibiotic. So really you should not change out the toothbrush until the next day. They also should not go to school the next morning because it's not been quite 24 hours, right? So then they need a full 24 hours on the antibiotics and then they can return to school on the second day and resume activities and things like that. The tonsil tonsillitis and tonsillectomy, what is our big concern here? after the tonsillectomy. Bleeding, right. So risk for hemorrhage, bleeding. So then what are your signs and symptoms of hemorrhage? So of course, if they vomit blood, then there's blood, but other not so noticeable signs like frequent swallowing, and restlessness can also be signs of hemorrhage that can be ignored. So knowing that those are signs and symptoms of hemorrhage, you can intervene early, right? So question, the nurse is reviewing the lab results for a child scheduled for a tonsillectomy. The nurse determines that which lab value is most significant to review. Right, a decreased blood pressure would be a late sign like see, vomiting blood would be a late sign. So which lab value would we be looking at after a tonsillectomy? If our big concern is bleeding. PT, right, so prothrombin time. So post-operative bleeding is a concern. It's one of the main concerns after tonsillectomy. While the other lab values are important to know before procedure, um, they're not really gonna affect how we care for the client. Um, uh, we might give them fluids or an antibiotic, but they might already be on an antibiotic because of the procedure. Um, so the most concerning, most threatening, most um, potential to um, harm our client would be related to that prothrombin time because they're already at risk for bleeding. And if that PTT level, PT level INR is high, then of course we're going to be at an increased, more increased risk for bleeding, right? Now, otitis media is an infection of what part of the ear? Middle, yeah. So fluid and infection are in the inner ear. There's no symptoms on the um, outside. So all of the symptoms are on the inside. The fluid, the infection, the pain is all inner. They, they may have a popping sensation when they swallow. That's just due to the pressure moving. Um, so then our symptoms are going to be not so obvious. You're going to have tugging on that ear, um, no drainage, not sensitive to touch or pulling, and it's not going to be red or um, swollen on the outside because that's an otitis externa or all of those. Um, so an interna can be quite difficult um, if you don't know 
or don't notice the tugging is really the main symptom, irritability. And then once the fever starts, then that's when the child usually goes to the doctor. But that early sign is going to be that tugging on the affected ear. Okay. <clears throat> so when we have an inner ear infection, the concern is a ruptured tympanic membrane. Um, so that infection and that fluid that's on the inner ear is um, putting so much pressure on the tympanic membrane that it bursts. So what is going to be the sign of that is a sudden decrease or relief in pain that all of a sudden they're absolutely fine. No problem. Um, and like it didn't happen and then pain will come again in a short while because of the rupture. But the pain from the inner ear, the middle ear infection is drastic relieved. So that's going to be your sign of a ruptured membrane. Croup? What is croup? What's the concern with group? This acute lar I can't spell it. <laughs> Laratracheal bronchitis. Yes, laratracheal bronchitis. So we're gonna treat with cool mist. So I do the C and the C because of croup cool. Um, but remember when you're looking at the terminology that you don't forget what you're treating again, like the strep. Um, so this is croup. Uh, Laratracheal bronchitis. So we're going to treat with cool mist therapy. The reason that the cool mist works is because of the obstruction and the swelling in the airway, right? Mm -hmm. So all of our treatments are going to be to de decrease that airway obstruction. So we're going to need to monitor during their therapy, their breathing and oxygen. So this is where ABCs are going to matter. Right, so it's due to an airway obstruction. So we're gonna do the most that we can as possible. We don't want the child to start crying. We don't want them to start um, uh, having an increase in inflammation. So if a child is upset or starts crying, you wanna control them immediately. Even if it's stopping whatever you're doing and giving them back to the mom and you just start all over your airway is more important than your procedure. So to protect your airway, you might have to give the baby back to the parent. They stop crying. You know, when we cry, everything swells up, everything runs, fluid, mucus, um, you get ugly cry. That little bit of inflammation and irritation could be all the airway that they have. And so trying to be as least traumatic as possible is the key here. And monitoring the breathing and oxygen status. So with your SpO2 monitor, your heart, your respiratory rate, um, you're listening to lung sounds often. So you're constantly checking airway. So Child with larotracheal bronchitis, which is croup, is placed in a tent. Mother becomes concerned because the child is frightened, consistently crying, trying to climb out of the tent. What is the nurse most appropriate nursing action? What do you think? Yeah. So. I kind of gave it away beforehand, but it's also important to note that this can be done as blow by. This can, doesn't um, have to be directly at their face um, and the tent is around them to maintain that moisture. But the delivery device does not have to be directly at their face. In children, the best way we can get some time is through a blow by. So if the mom is in there and holding it over the child's face, that is perfectly okay. Um, epiglottitis. This is another airway emergency. This is marked by the barking seal cough. 
um, and drooling. The hallmark sign here is drooling. So if a child comes in and they have um, respiratory symptoms um, and this barking cough, and then they you start noticing that when they're sitting still, they're still drooling, no effort, but drooling. This is a medical emergency. So then what do you need to do? Save the airway, yes, always airway, airway, right? So they're also gonna be on droplet precautions, but to save the airway, you're not gonna visualize that throat on your own, remember? So you're not gonna put a tongue blade in there. You're not gonna ask them to open up, let me see your throat or anything like that. You're gonna wait for the doctor and you're gonna get everything ready just in case and at the bedside to intubate. So that if when the doctor does check their throat with the um, tongue blade, stimulates more swelling and you lose your airway that you can go ahead and immediately intervene, right? So then we're also with your airway monitoring that oxygen status. So how do you do that again? So your SpO2 monitor, your respiratory rate, you're checking lung sounds um, frequently, right? So a nurse employed in the emergency department is monitoring the child diagnosed with epiglottitis. The nurse notes that the child is leaning forward with the chin thrust out. How should the nurse interpret this finding? C, yeah, so remember this is obstruction of the airway. So then what is that very similar to? COPD, yeah, so that's that tripod positioning, right? So leaning forward, supporting on their arms, chin thrust out, mouth open. They can have nasal flaring, tachycardia, high fever, and sore throat. But that's all due to trying to breathe. So remember the patho that's going on with all of these things, and you can kind of lead through to the end, right? So um, that is the reason for their positioning is due to the airway obstruction. Larotracheal bronchitis. Which one is this one? Did I duplicate this? I guess I did. <laughs> I guess I put a croup and a lower tracheal bronchitis. Well, anyways, again, here's your cool mist tent. We'll talk about croup again. Uh, you're gonna decrease the obstruction due to the airway inflammation. That's gonna be your goal, right? Because of the inflammation blocking the airway, our goal is to decrease that inflammation, decrease that obstruction. So then, just how you're monitoring it, how are you going to prove that you have improved by your respiratory rate getting better, that they have airway clearance, that they're able to cough up any mucus secretions and um, decrease in strider. So especially if they had a strider beforehand because of such severe obstruction that their strider is going away um, and that hopefully it is completely gone, but we need to make sure just because you don't audibly hear a strider, you still need to listen to that lung because they could stop stridering because the lung has collapsed. Okay, so you still need to do your assessment. Sorry that this is a good thing. RSV, what is RSV? Yeah. 
That's what I meant by the lung is closed. The airway has completely collapsed. That's why there's no more strider because it's not whistling around the obstruction because it's completely obstructed now. RSV. So this is a virus. Um, so it's going to be uh, spread through contact with bodily fluids. So you're going to make sure that you're practicing good respiratory hygiene. You cough into a tissue, you throw the tissue away. You don't leave it at the bedside. So um, if they're in the hospital, give them a little baggie to put it all in so that it's not just sitting around. Um, so then they're going to be on contact precautions, which means that they need their own equipment, right? So they need their own um, vital sign machine, their own thermometer, their own um, contact gowns, their own stethoscope, everything that's involved with contact precautions, right? So that they're not spreading that through those bodily fluids <clears throat> to another person. So then there's that respiratory hygiene. Bronchiolitis. So this is common cold symptoms, but with apneic spells. They may have an intermittent fever, but the concern here is because of the apnea, um, making this bronchiolitis a potential for an emergency, right? So it could be a cold, 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 cold symptoms for but then they start to have apneic spells. This is when we're very concerned. This can um, often occurs in infants that are less than a year old, so new infants. Um, so sometimes this is when uh, in the middle of the night, uh, the infant stops breathing um, and the mom is checking on them or they're breastfeeding or feeding them in the middle of the night and they just stopped breathing after they laid them down. Um, they turn blue in the face. Um, they may cough themselves awake and turn regular, but they should still be seen um, just to make sure what type of apnea issue is going on. Um, so yeah, apnea spells are definitely always a concern. They should not be ignored. So nurse preparing an infant with the bronchiolitis that has been caused by a recent RSV infection, which intervention should the nurse include in the plan of care? Select all the apply. Should they have their own private room? So you gotta think about two things here. So they still have RSV, but they're having bronchiolitis inflammation of the bronchioles and having those apneic spells. Yeah, so they're gonna need their own private room. What about ensuring that the, head, the infant's head is in a flexed position? So flex position would be like chin to chest. So think about that child with airway obstruction with the tripole chin thrust out, right? Not to the chest. So that would not have a flex position. It would be an extended position. Um, so no to be. Wearing a mask, gown, and gloves when in contact with the infant, yes or no? Yes. You brought that in there first. Well, you're going to have your rationale there. And place the infant in a tent that delivers warm, humidified air. Position the infant on the side with the head lower than the chest. Ensure the nurse is caring for the infant. With RSV, do not care for other high-risk children. So yes for this last one. This says warm, humidified air. Usually cool mist is gonna help with decreasing that inflammation, yeah. So 
I didn't like this question because of that. Just one word that changed the whole phrase. <laughs> but I showed it to you guys anyways. So making sure that the RSV client is in a private room, that they're um, in their own contact environment, that um, spreading through droplets or contact secretions. So that respiratory hygiene. Yes, breathing warm air is hard. Just think about the humidity that happens here in Georgia. Not fun. All right, pertussis. Hot summer day. That's right. So pertussis, what's the other name for this? Whooping cough. Yep. Whooping cough. So we're going to prevent this with a Tdap because this P has pertussis in it. So this is a virus that for adults is similar to the common cold and symptoms. And so unbeknownst to us, we are spreading it to infants and children, which can be deadly to infants, and especially newborn infants who don't quite have that immune system. And especially even more so to that point, the infants that are um, not breastfed. So this can be a virus that you don't know that you carry. Um, so they actually do recommend that um, the mother and the dad to be receive a Tdap before the baby is born. So that at least in the immediate contact of the infant that they have protection from that pertussis that could be spread around. So you've got your tetanus and diphtheria also, but the P is the pertussis. Foreign body aspiration. This is an obstruction of the airway because something is in there. Um, and so then our risk is going to be what? We're going to monitor for, treat for, prevent. <coughs> Right, this could be anything. It could be food, grapes, hot dogs. What's the concern of them aspirating? That we'll see in like three or four days. Pneumonia, there you go. Aspiration pneumonia. So good oral hygiene. We're going to you know, cough hygiene, uh, anything to clear out after the obstruction, you know, any histamines, uh, anything to try and get out from the lower airways as possible before an infection sets in. So risk for pneumonia. And of course, monitoring for the signs and symptoms of pneumonia that yeah. will come in three or four days. <laughs> Um, so sometimes that education is missed. Um, let me go back. Performed by aspiration. So, oh yeah, your child, you know, aspirated or choked on a food item, but they coughed up the food item. We'll do a chest X-ray. We don't see anything. Okay, great. You're just you'll be fine. Help, of course, be irritated. Um, throat airway will be irritated, but he'll be fine. But then in three or four days, they get a fever and cough, and they don't know that it's probably due to the foreign body aspiration. So a piece of the food product or juice or something started that inflammatory infectious process down there. Right? So, um, Education there is often missed. Just my little soapbox there. <clears throat> asthma. Asthma, asthma, asthma. So there's quite a few things on this one. So main thing with asthma, 
of course, if you know what's triggering you, avoid those triggers. Um, knowing the difference between mild asthma and severe asthma. So what those symptoms look like. A mild asthmatic client are going to have maybe some daytime symptoms, have minor limitations to activities, whereas severe asthmatic client is going to have also nighttime symptoms and major limitations to activities. So a goal for the asthmatic client is, of course, the PEF of 80% or greater. A severe asthmatic client probably won't hit that 80% goal on most given days. So this is more indicative of a mild asthmatic, mild to moderate. Um, you're going to treat with a bronchial dilator um, for your rescue inhaler, but you're also, if they're using combination therapy, they need education that that bronchial dilator is first, right? So that bronchial dilator opens the airways and then that lets the corticosteroid or whatever combination um, inhaler that they're using to actually get down to the lower airways and be the most effective. Cystic fibrosis. This is just mucus, 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 mucus. That's just think of it as mucus. There's mucus everywhere, right? But we're going to diagnose this with a sweat chloride test. Sweat chloride test, right? So how do we get all this mucus out? We're going to use a bronchodilator first and then place them in a lying on their side um, as most Trendelenburg as possible with them still being able to breathe. Of course, don't force them to go into Trendelenburg if they can't breathe, but as best as possible. And then you're going to do the chest physiotherapy. So that's um, vibration, percussion, and um, expulsion. Can't think of the third one, but it's vibrating the mucus off of the walls, um, beating it off the large ones off, and then coughing it out. But of course, you only want to loosen secretions from the walls of the lungs during exhalation. You don't want them inhaling and moving it further down if it is dislodged. So you want it to only do the physiotherapy during exhalation. So there's starts, there's pauses. Um, and we've already tried to open up that airway as best as possible and promote airway clearance of the mucus in that position for the Trendelenburg and opening up with a bronchodilator, okay? Is that any questions with chest physiotherapy, CPT? I feel like these are the two biggest things that NCLEX ever asks about cystic fibrosis. That's where my focus is. No questions so far, so. Breathing exercises and postural drainage are prescribed for a hospitalized child with cystic fibrosis. What instruction should the nurse include in the client's teaching plan? <clears throat> Right. Cystic fibrosis is due to um, and affects the pancreas as well. So it's due to the pancreatic enzymes that's creating the congestion, the mucus. So then you actually have the mucus in the pancreas as well. Ms. Gilbert, mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt. What I was referring to was the, um, I can't remember the name of it. I don't want to call it, it's not pancreas, but that's what it is, enzymes. That is the medication. You see that often as well. It's the medication given to those children um, who have some oh, to, to break down the mucus. It's, gosh, I can't remember. But it's very common. You see it frequently on exams. Mm -hmm. um, 
I can't remember the name of it. I'll look for it. Okay. I didn't see that in the book. <clears throat> so doing these postural drainage and breathing exercises, what are we going to include in their plan? Yeah. So this one was a little bit of a thinker, but thinking about airway and getting everything out of the airway, the postural drainage and percussion promotes that mucus from coming off the walls, right? And then you do these breathing exercises to propel them out. So why are we doing these in a certain way at certain times? There's reason to the madness. So postural drainage mobilizes the secretions and the breathing exercises assist with the expert expectoration. Right. Pancreolipase, is that right, Miss Love? Creon? Yes, I was about to type that. Thank you. That's exactly what it is. Um, that's something that is is very frequently um, asked about cystic fibrosis in addition to what Ms. Gilbert mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. Creon is, is pancreatic and it's pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. Which is what's causing it, is mm -hmm. that enzyme lacking. Right, so yeah, that's it's... something that they have to take for life basically. So that's, that's mm -hmm. a major part of the treatment. I just know I see that frequently, so. Okay. Thank you. Makes sense, thank you. All right, that is the end of my review. Any questions about endocrine and respiratory? To bringing it back to those major concepts, airway for respiratory, and then the, the uh, hormone for the endocrine, and then you can walk it through. And take your time. Okay. That was just a quick overview of the main big issues, big things to look for. So um, this should be comprehensive. <laughs> so I'm going to add that here. That wasn't even in my lecture. Crayon. All right. It doesn't want that. That's okay. All right. I'll post this in uh, Canvas. Go away. As soon as this is done being in my way. Any questions while I get that posted? And then, Miss Love, you can take over for your part. Okay. Um, I'm going to do review over cardiovascular and hematology. A little bit different, but it will achieve the same goal in making sure that we cover the things that I think you really need to know or it might be um, more important, if that makes sense. Okay, so. Okay. It's now posted in module four instead of above in the in class session. So it's in module four just above the exam. Do you mind moving mine as well? Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to wait on publishing it or? No, you can publish it, it's fine. I'll move yours to right with mine. No, wait, because I want them to answer questions. <laughs> okay. Well, mine is published. Yours are there, so you can okay. publish as soon as you're done. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let's do cardiac first. And wait a minute. Okay, 
So hopefully this will work the way I want it to. It's just some slash. Up. Okay. So first of all, um, please tell me if you can't hear me and let me see if I can open the chat so that I can see if there's any questions or concerns. Okay. So this is over the pediatric cardi uh, cardiac uh, content and it's, I don't know how this got here. <laughs> This is over, it should be cardiac, but it looks like first question is um, immune. That's okay. So the nurse suspects that a child has erythema infectiosum, which is fifth disease, based on which finding. So this is basically asking which is, which of these is a presentation or manifestation of fifth disease. And it's technically A, B, C, and D. Okay. All right. I hear A, so that's yeah. So fifth disease has that slapped face appearance. And if you can remember that, what I try to do when I'm studying uh, content is to try to make word associations. So um, if you think erythema which is in the title, that's redness, right? So if you were to slap anybody's face, regardless of the skin color, it may not be as prevalently, I mean, may not be as obvious, but anybody's face is going to redden, right? So one of the ways to remember this erythema infectiosum is the slap face appearance. It's going to be red. And then also another way to think about it is most people, not everybody. That's literally what I was going to say, Jennifer, is five fingers. <laughs> I was going to say most people. <laughs> most people have five fingers. So a five finger slap across the face. <laughs> um, but what I also want to review is another way to recall the um, other ones. So with exanthema, which is roseola, if you think it has sort of a, I couldn't find necessarily rose peak, but it has this roses, rosy pink color. And then also one of the things that um, you all covered in, I don't know if it was recently or in A&P, but if you think about the type of rash, a maculopapular. So this is like a flattened um, rash that has, is, is flattened, maybe has flattened and then becomes raised. That's what maculopapular means. And so it's sort of pink like, and that's the roseola. And then chicken pox, I think everybody might be able to recognize. So typically what you're going to have are the um, macules to papules, which becomes actually a vesicle, which is a blister. Okay. And then rubella is going to be a little more red, a uh, pinkish red. Um, and another thing about these conditions is when it says discrete, it means that they're individualized. Whereas with Say chicken pox, you know how those little, and even with impetigo, which I don't know if we talked about that, um, but as they become vesicle, vesicles, they sort of connect, if you all know what I mean, they, they connect. And so where you have maybe two or three small individual discrete vesicles or raised areas, they sort of merge once they become vesicles. And so when they say discrete, what they mean is that they don't merge with other lesions. They're individual. Um, and so there's some distance between them. You know, the distance may not be very much, but there is distance and they don't merge to become like one big blister, as in chicken pox. Okay, very good. Okay, maybe the next one is cardiac. Okay, you are monitoring an infant with heart failure. Which signs alert you, nurses, to suspect fluid accumulation and the need to call the physician? I see B, a weight gain of one pound in a day, okay? And that's absolutely right. 
especially. So we know that in adults, we're concerned about um, a two pound weight gain overnight or over within a week. But think about how much more important it is to be mindful of weight in a child, okay? Or, or, or specifically an infant. So a weight gain of half a kilogram or one pound overnight is significant, okay? And so you're gonna call the physician. Um, with heart failure, you all, um, are, if you remember that you wanna make sure that you're assessing, you're gonna do strict I's and O's, but especially in children, you're going to monitor your output. And one of the best ways to monitor output is weighing diapers, okay? That's the most accurate method of weighing, of, excuse me, of assessing urine output in a child. Like you're not going to do in and out catheters and we're going to reserve a catheter for when they absolutely need it because we know that Foley catheters um, are high sources of infection, okay? So we're going to assess urine output. We're going to monitor for um, manifestations of of fluid accumulation as in edema, specifically facial edema. That's um, severe edema, not that commonly, thank you. I mean, not commonly seen, thank you very much. But um, if you see facial edema, that's, that's a major problem. More often you're gonna see peripheral edema, but certainly you're going to listen to lung sounds and inform the physician of weight gain, okay? Now, regarding your other responses, um, you're going to see a rapid heart rate. If you think about heart failure, the basic pathophys is because the path um Ms. Gilbert, can you, if you're still here, can you see that? Takia wants to be letting, I don't know if I can do it. Hold on, I'll see if I can. Ms. Gilbert's not here. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Um, what was I saying? So with heart failure, the basic pathophys is that there's going to be decreased cardiac output because of the um, enlarged ventricles for whatever reason. And so what the body's going to do, anytime there's decrease in cardiac output, the, the heart is going to try to work harder. And part of that is speeding up to get blood out and then to get blood back to the heart, to the heart muscle. So instead of um, slowing down, things are going to speed up. And so one of that's going to be, in this situation, it's going to be tachypnea, as it mentions here, it's going to have a more rapid respiration also because of fluid accumulation that's not going forward, but it's backing up into the lungs. And so that's going to be um, another reason for increased breathing is that they've got fluid in their lungs. And then certainly increased blood pressure because um, uh, fluid accumulation, fluid retention. All right. Uh, it says diaphoresis is a sign of heart failure, but it's not specific to fluid accumulation. And basically diaphoresis is going to be when they have a higher O2 demand, such as when they're very active or crying or things of that nature. Any questions here? Okay, moving on. So you have a child with a diagnosis of Tetralogy of Fallot who is exhibiting an increased depth and rate of respirations. On further assessment, the nurse notes increased hypoxemia. How does the nurse interpret these findings? What's happening? What is the child experiencing? hypersyanotic, which is also called a tet spell. So again, word association. One of the things that is most commonly, as far as in testing, when you see tetralogy of Fallot, you can pretty much expect that they're going to ask you about a tet spell, which is that hypersyanotic um, episode. Okay, so regarding that, Again, um, going to have increased hypoxemia. Hypox is going to be low oxygen. Emia is going to be in the blood. And then they're breathing 
more deeply and they are, so basically they're gonna have labored breathing, okay? Um, and so the thing about this is you would think that you would need to inform the physician immediately, right? Um, normally when we see someone having labored breathing, we would definitely wanna inform the physician. Well, you're gonna inform the physician but only after you provide the treatment or the recommended or expected nursing intervention for this particular condition. So the initial nursing action is to place the child in the knee chest position. What that does is it increases, it's sort of, uh, I think Jamie said an accordion in our, in our session. But if you think about it, if you, you're bending the knees up, and bending the knees up to the chest. So you're, you're increasing that upper body perfusion. And so you're gonna increase uh, pulmonary blood flow and you're gonna increase your systemic arterial oxygenation by decreasing venous return, okay? Now, this is in an infant. In toddlers and children, they are actually taught to squat down, especially as a child gets older because even with, um, even with surgical interventions, they may still have some, they shouldn't have as many, certainly, after surgical intervention, um, but they may still have some residual effects, but even more so if it's identified later, typically it shouldn't be, but if it's identified later, um, the children are taught to squat. They squat down and it, it basically provides the same intervention. Okay, so I did want to make you aware of that toddlers and children will squat to relieve that hypoxia because it right here it says it's, they can have chronic hypoxia. Okay, so word association, tetralogy of Fallot, we're going to have a tet spell, which is a hypercyanotic episode, which means that they're perfusing or circulating or systemic blood is highly deoxygenated. Okay, and so this is where you will see this widespread or maybe even lower extremity, but definitely widespread cyanosis. And so the nursing intervention is to put the child, especially an infant, into the knee chest position. If it's an older child, the child will have the child to squat down. Questions? All right, you are, nurses, you are reviewing the record of a child um, suspected, well, actually diagnosed with aortic stenosis. Which clinical manifestation would you expect to find in this condition? So before you answer your question, you have to think about, and I would encourage you all to think about, what do I know about aortic stenosis? So what do I know about a state, what the aorta? The aorta is the major artery that carries blood from the left ventricle, which should, should be oxygenated blood from the left ventricle to the body, to everything, right? It feeds everything. Um, stenosis is going to be a narrowing. So if there is a narrowing within the aorta, then that means I'm going to have decreased oxygenated perfusion. So as a result of that, which of these would be a manifestation of that process? And I see number four, absolutely right. So one of the manifestations, and this manifestation is more specific in this condition, in aortic stenosis than in the others. Um, you can have this in all of them, but it's this, well, excuse me, you can have some level of, um, decreased activity, but activity intolerance, let me restate that, activity intolerance is more specific in aortic stenosis. stenosis. So um, because if you think about it again, you have a child that's exercising, running, playing, coughing, um, whatever, anything that's going to increase oxygenation demand, O2 demand. So 
when there is an increase, just basic physiology, right? A and P. When there is an increased need for oxygen, heart rate's gonna speed up, you're gonna have an increase in cardiac output. And under normal situations, again, you're gonna have an increase in oxygenated cardiac output, well oxygenated. So in this situation wherein the pathway for that oxygenated blood to get to the tissues, there is a stenosis. So there's a blockage or an obstruction or a hindrance. And so the child or the person requiring that extra oxygen will not receive that adequate oxygenation. So they're gonna be fatigued and tired much more quickly. As well, they can certainly develop chest pain and dizziness because dizziness from the lack of oxygenation to the blood, I mean, excuse me, to the brain, lack of oxygenation to the, to the brain, and then chest pain because it's the same sort of manifestation of an MI. It's the same thing where they're not receiving enough, enough um, blood back to the cardiac muscle. So that's why they would have chest pain. And then also from that heart, working harder. Okay, good work. Moving on. Whoa, sorry. Well, gave that one away. But <laughs> you have a child admitted with Kawasaki in your plan of care. What are you going to monitor for? So moving on, um, heart failure. So again, when you are thinking word association, Kawasaki disease, even though it's not a cardiac condition, it impacts the heart. So if you remember that, that Kawasaki disease, it impacts the heart. It's not necessarily a heart condition, but it has uh, implications in the cardiac system. So you're going to monitor for heart failure. Okay, when you all um, are familiar, if you're not, um, but I think you're all familiar with the signs of heart failure, so we'll go on. Good work. Okay, you are caring for an infant with a diagnosis of a congenital heart disease, so we don't know which one this one is, okay? Which finding on physical assessment does the nurse attribute to chronic hypoxia? So which of these is a manifestation of chronic hypoxia? All right, I see one. And, okay, yeah, it's actually clubbings. So this doesn't have to be, this is not specific to uh, heart, congenital heart disease. This is any condition, COPD, um, chronic bronchitis, all of anything wherein there is ongoing hypoxia, then what you will see is clubbing of the fingers, okay? So typically we see this in older adults who've had you know, long-term lung disease, but definitely we can have this in children, okay? And it's a result of, again, anoxia, which is lack of oxygenation or um, poor oxygenation. This is especially true in conditions where there is a right to left shunt and circulating blood is primarily deoxygenated. So if you think back to just A and P in the when we're talking about a right to left shunt, we're talking about, if you remember the right side of the heart, right atrial, right ventricle, you should have deoxygenated blood on that side because you've got systemic blood returning and it has already dropped off its oxygen, okay? So you've got deoxygenated blood on the right. And when you have a right to left shunt, there is some type of abnormal opening wherein blood can, um, shunt from the right side deoxygenated to mix that deoxygenated blood to the left side and that left so if it's an atrial opening atrial septal uh, defect then you've got deoxygenated blood from the right atria shunting over to the left atria and then that deoxygenated blood is then um it leaves the left atria, left ventricle, and then it's going out to the body. So that circulating or systemic blood now is more deoxygenated than oxygenated. So you're going to see this happening, this chronic hypoxia, much more frequently when there is a right to left shunt, okay? 
Now, the tachycardia and tachypnea, you would see that with hypoxia, but these are going to be compensatory mechanisms that are occurring when there's acute hypoxia, such as with a TET spell. Okay, when there's chronic hypoxia, the body has actually begun to adapt to that decreased oxygenation, so they would not have ongoing there's not gonna be ongoing tachycardia and ongoing tachypnea. That's gonna be an acute situation. So something that maybe worsens whatever the heart disease condition is. Okay, questions about this information? Okay, so um, what I wanted to do, and I will only do this if you all want me to, but what I wanted to do was encourage you all to remember to review this content as far as um, especially these categories right here. So wherein you have increased um, pulmonary blood flow. This is where we have the majority of the blood that is going to the lungs maybe abnormally because of some type of defect. So just be mindful of how to identify um, an ASD, is this going to cause increased blood flow to the lungs or decreased blood flow to the lungs or will it be mixed blood flow? Okay, so how do you all feel about that? All right, everybody good with those? Okay, I didn't know if you all wanted me to review all of those because it is pretty lengthy and this is just a review. So that's why I didn't do all of them, but I, I encourage you to be able to recognize that TET is going to cause decreased blood flow to the lungs and that um, you know aortic stenosis is gonna cause an obstruction of systemic flow. Okay, all right then. I think that's all on this one. and. I'm going to stop sharing and we'll do the hematology and oncology and immune system. So again, any questions regarding cardiac review? Um, something else I, I literally just thought about this. I made this yesterday, but B aware of the treatment, um, specifically DIG. I'll help you out with DIG. Um, know, be knowledgeable about digoxin administration in children. Okay. Because I didn't put a question on there about that. Be mindful of digoxin administration in children. Um, okay, hematology. Trying to see if you all put your scene. Okay. Okay, nurses, you are caring for a child with a diagnosis of hemophilia. Okay. And heme arthrosis is suspected because the child is complaining of pain in the joints. What measure should the nurse expect to be prescribed for the child? And if you recall, a couple of things I want to say. Um, think about what hemophilia is. Hemophilia is a condition where there is um, abnormal clotting, right? So these children are at high risk for bleeding. Heme arthrosis, as I mentioned on Tuesday, this is part is going to be blood. A-R-T-H-R-O is going to indicate joint involvement. So they're bleeding into the joint. Okay. Often identified um, or excuse me, manifested as pain first. Okay. Pain in the joints. And then you may see some um, increase in size. Another thing I wanted to remind you all is that when you see prescribed, this is something that's relatively new. It used to say ordered in, 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 
exam questions. You should say the doctor will order or the physician will order or what have you. But lately they've been saying prescribed. And so typically when we see prescribed, we think a medication, but a prescription is just an order. Okay. So for this child who has hemophilia and they've developed heme arthrosis, what is going to be the prescription or order? Okay, actually, best answer here is going to be, sorry, that was loud, application of a bivalve. So you want to immobilize this joint. That's going to be your best answer. But let's talk about the others. Well, I'll actually read this. In an acute period, immobilization is, is the best prescription. Um, moving this joint when they're having an, an acute um they say acute period, um, actually increases bleeding. So for this time, so if we're talking about maintenance, um, ongoing treatment, maintenance therapy would be range of motion because you definitely don't want the, the joints to become stiffened from lack of use. So, but this is an acute situation. And so you want to minimize movement at this time. Okay. Um, application of heat is going to worsen the situation because heat, you know, promotes blood flow. And so we, and also can promote, um, well, it promotes blood flow via vasodilation. So basically applying heat is going to make this situation worse. It's going to increase the bleeding. And then NSAIDs, we talked about this previously as well. Um, I was going to say, um, NSAIDs also can prolong bleeding time. I think I talked about that on Tuesday. So you, in this situation, this person for pain, they can have, you know, more likely acetaminophen. But for the, the best answer of these options is going to be um, immobilize the joint for the acute period. Um, range of motion would be when they're in maintenance therapy, you would actually apply cold to cause vasoconstriction if that, I hope that makes sense. So when there is swelling of, of any type, um, but especially in, in this type of situation, you actually wanna apply cold because it will cause vasoconstriction, which is gonna um, decrease the diameter of the vessel. And it's gonna help with that swelling and with the bleeding because We've got, um, you know, small vessels that are bleeding. So we want to decrease the diameter. And then with, instead of an inset, we're going to give something like acetaminophen for pain. Okay, is that clear? Questions? Okay. Um, this is one of your immunization um conditions. So you have a child who is hospitalized with pertussis in the convalescent stage and is being prepared for discharge, which statement by a parent indicates a need for further instruction. So the item that you choose is going to be incorrect. So which of these is incorrect regarding pertussis? Okay, I see one. And that is correct. Pertussis is tr transmitted by direct uh, contact or respiratory droplets. And the communicable period um, occurs primarily, through, and you all don't have to know that. That's just part of that statement. Respiratory precautions are not required during the convalescent phase. And so this is after their communicable period. Okay. so. I want to remind you all to be aware of your communicable periods in the conditions that were highlighted and underlined. You don't have to know them for all of them because there are a lot, but especially those that are not highlighted, but starred and underlined, the one that we ask you all to sort of focus on. So you want to be mindful of your communicability stages, and that is in your content. Okay. 
So they do, it's not necessarily when they're in a convalescent stage, this is where they're sort of healing, if you will, recovery. This would have, this um, droplet precautions in a quiet environment would have been at the onset of the condition when they began um, experiencing symptoms. They may actually vomit. My daughter had this, or they thought she had it when she was younger. Um, vomiting certainly can occur when a child has coughing episodes. That can occur with any coughing condition. Um, coughing spells may certainly be triggered by dust and smoke, and they definitely need to encourage fluids. So, good work. Okay. A uh, nurse provides instructions to the mother of a child with mumps regarding respiratory precautions. And the mother asks the nurse about the length of time, how long do they need to stay on respiratory precautions? So which of these is a correct statement or response to the mother? Okay, I see a one and I can't move it. There we are. Right. Precautions are indicated during the period of communicability. So again, well, this is mumps, excuse me. Um, but either direct contact or droplets from someone who is infected. And you can only use, well, precautions are only effective during the communicability. And the problem with that is a lot of times especially with viral infections, um, the period of communicability, just like with this COVID, is prior to the person being aware that they actually have it. So many times, that's how these things are spread, uh, especially viruses. They're spread because most people are not aware of the exposure. Because if you all recall, typically you are contagious before your symptoms, actually, before the onset of symptoms. Okay. But um, once the swelling begins or once the symptoms begin, then the um, person is still um, contagious. Okay. Precautions are not necessary before the swelling begins. And the rationale for that is because you don't know, right? Um, and it's not necessarily possible unless there is a known um, exposure, right? Like what we're doing now with COVID, wherein if we are around, if we come into contact with someone who has, who is, who is positive for COVID, then we, because we are at risk now of becoming communicable, right, or contagious to someone else, we are now quarantining, quarantining ourselves. So that's basically what this is saying. Um, precautions are not in, are indicated for 20 days following, that's not true. And um, precautions are not necessary once the swelling appears, that's not true. It's um, the thing that to remember and to provide education on to your community and, you know, those around you is that oftentimes, oftentimes we're not aware of when we are infected, okay? All right, moving on. Uh, your child has uh, diagno been diagnosed with rubiola or measles, and a pediatrician has documented complex spots. So what basically, what is a manifestation of these complex spots? What do they look like? Okay, yeah, it's 
those small they have like a red base and then um like a whitish yeah bluish white spot in the middle um and the buccal mucosa you all know what that is okay one what so i mentioned word association that's something that's often asked also about rubiola or measles is the copelet spots so if you are if you um it will help you to make an association with uh, rubiola, measles, and the copelet spots. That's something that's frequently um, asked when they ask about measles. That's one of the main things that they typically see. Okay. Okay, nurses, you're asked to prepare for the admission of a child to the unit with a diagnosis of a Wilms tumor. You are creating a care plan, and which of these interventions should you include in your plan for care of a diagnosis? of Williams tumor. Okay, I see your response number three. All right. With Williams tumor, Wilms is an a, a renal kidney tumor, and it is located in the abdomen. And this is one you will absolutely, this is what I was referring to on Tuesday when I said that when you're doing your um, abdominal assessment. This is why you don't, you know, put your hand in and just start digging around in your big circles and all of that. Because if there is a mass there, you can actually cause those cells to break off and cause metastasis of a condition. So that's very, very important. And I see you all are seeing that, right? You can rupture that tumor, causing those malignant cells to, to, um, to spread and get into the vasculature. So we don't want that. With, because, and then another thing is, again, if you're doing, say, word association, Wilms tumor, kidney, urine. Okay. So or hematuria, that's even more specific. Wilms tumor, abdomen, kidney, and hematuria. That's what I would think. It's a tumor, it's a, a kidney or renal tumor located in the abdomen, do not palpate and monitor for blood in the urine. Okay, clear questions? I think we are closing in. Um, you're reviewing the record of a 10-year-old child suspected of having Hodgkin's. Which characteristic manifestation should the nurse anticipate to be documented in the assessment notes for a child who has Hodgkin's disease? Okay, I see one. Yeah, so some things about Hodgkin's to be mindful of. Typical, so one, it is a condition of the lymphatic tissue. So most often what's going to be Im impacted are your lymph nodes. And we know that there's lymph nodes basically throughout the body. Many times what you have in um, Hodgkin's are the, um, the thoracic lymph nodes that can be impacted. So you have your supraclavicular, um, uh, multiple places. I'm skipping ahead, excuse me. Let me respond to the first, the correct answer, and then I'll go on. I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Okay, so you're gonna have painless, movable lymph nodes in the cervical area. And I had to look that up because my knowledge and my prior learning was that they are fixed, but your book said movable lymph nodes. Either way, the important part is that they are painless versus painful. Because again, painful lymph nodes are typically indicative of some type of infection. Okay, so painless. And, and the thing about these lymph nodes is that they can actually um, increase in size and then go down on their own. And so the, the, the one day they can be small and over the next two or three days they can enlarge dramatically. 
So they can actually change in size. But painless is the key term here um, in the cervical area, but also this is where I want to go. So you can also have these um, in multiple places, not just in the cervical and the supraclavicular. You can have them in the inguinal as well as in the chest, in the thoracic region. So the thing about that is that you want to be mindful of the thing to look for in Hodgkin's disease regarding the oncological emergencies associated with this one, especially is that superior vena cava syndrome that I mentioned the other day. And the reason for that is, if you recall from the, the visual, the image that I showed you of that heart with a tumor. So what happens again in SVC syndrome is that that tumor can compress the SVC. So if there is, if there are enlarged lymph nodes that are compressing the SVC, the, the malignant tumor that occurs, then what you're going to have is fluid that is normally returning from the upper body, the head, the arms, the upper chest, that's returning from the upper body. It's going to back up. So it's the same process as what we talked about in your stenosis, right? Fluid can't go forward, so it's going to back up. And what you, this is where I mentioned before that peripheral, excuse me, that um, facial edema. This is where you'll see facial edema. And I don't know if any of you have had um, the opportunity to palpate what's called crepitus in the tissue, but this is where fluid and or air is trapped within the tissue and you can actually palpate it. I know probably at least one of you in this group has probably seen that or heard of it or, or felt it. Um, but you can also feel that in this situation because fluid actually gets trapped into the tissue. So you have this massive um, backup of fluid and it's insidious. It can, it's, it happens slowly over time, but it can be fatal if not recognized because think about if fluid backs up, everything is swelling up. Our primary concern is the airway, right? So our primary concern is compromise of the airway due to compression of this um, edematous tissues. The other thing about Hodgkin's um, word association, okay? Word association, Hodgkin's lymph nodes, Reed Sternberg cells. This is something that you see frequently on NCLEX as well, because this is a specific diagnostic um, characteristic of Hodgkin's. So Hodgkin's lymph node read Sternberg cells. And the primary, there's many things that can happen in this condition, but the primary complication is going to be your superior vena cava syndrome. Okay, any questions about Hodgkin's? Okay, we have a child, excuse me, a, a nurse assessing a child who's scheduled to receive a live virus vaccine, so an immunization. What are the contraindications associated with receiving a live vaccine? So that basically is asking who should not receive a live virus vaccine? Okay, one. Should one, two, and five. Let's see. One, two. Okay. And for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and go to the responses. So, anyone who has had a previous anaphylactic reaction should never receive a vaccine, medication, or anything to which they've had um, an anaphylactic reaction. The other thing is if they have a severely deficient immune system. So recall, I think I was talking about 
the child with cancer, but this applies to any condition. So someone who's on steroids, um, high dose steroids, and their immune system has been compromised. Someone who has HIV and their immune system is compromised. Any condition wherein there is a compromised immune system, they should not receive a live virus vaccination. Okay. Now, with a cold, um, they can. It just, it depends upon the severity of it, if that makes sense. So a lot of times, you know, children typically frequently have, um, um, you know, cold viruses and things of that nature. But they will, they may, they will still give it to them um, unless they're like severely ill. But just a normal cold, that would not be a reason not to administer the vaccine. Um, diarrhea is not a contraindication, and this certainly is not. Um, the child has been recently exposed to an infectious disease. That in and of itself is not necessarily a reason not to vaccinate. Your main concerns are going to be um, a deficiency in an immunodeficiency and a recent or previous anaphylactic reaction. Those are going to be the main reasons. Okay, so even right here, it says a vaccine is administered with caution to an individual with moderate or severe illness with or without fever. So even a fever, um, but again, it depends on the severity. I think I'm done. I think this is the end of it, Jennifer, actually. That's it. So I hit on the, the things that I felt like might be um, you needed reminding of. I'll put it like that. Okay things that are sort of, um, that may have been missed or something, okay? If you all have any questions, please email us. Thank you all for hanging in. We know it was two hours, but we're glad that you all were able to make it. This is recorded, and um, you all have a great, great day. Thank you. Stop recording. Ms. Gilbert, I, I think you will have to stop recording. I don't see an option for me to do it. Okay. Got it. Got it.